tonight. I thought I was going to die for sure. And then when I woke up, I was very upset that I was alive. We aim light into the darkness. And as a serious public health problem that no one's talking about. Survivors of suicide share their sadness and offer hope so no one will ever go through it again. There's a lot of guilt and suicide on the families left behind. Experts caution all of us, staying silent on the topic will only make things worse. If we really want people to get the help that they need, we have to start talking about it. For the next half hour. Is there anything out there that can get me out of this? From WOWT 6 News, Lifeline for Teens, Suicide Prevention Special. Here now, Brian Mastry and Mallory Maddox. Good evening. The statistics are alarming and heartbreaking. The CDC recently released new data showing the suicide rates have been increasing and on the rise for the last 15 years in ages between 10 and 75. And public health experts argue that because suicide carries a stigma of shame, many people simply refuse to talk about it. But tonight we are. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. When she's behind the guitar, it's easy to hear Allie Walleen has a gift. As a Nebraska teenager, she didn't recognize it as that. Hopelessness can happen to anybody. I didn't know how to deal with it, and I didn't know how to deal with feeling alone, and I didn't know how to deal with feeling like um, I didn't belong anywhere. When she was 15, Allie Walleen started cutting herself. She wanted to know, would people care if she was gone? It wasn't working. It wasn't, it wasn't helping me. It wasn't fixing the problem. It wasn't solving my pain. It got to the point where I would um, like carry around a little pouch full of pills just in case, you know, I got so sad that I couldn't handle it. She eventually figured it out because she's with us tonight. Loneliness is a pretty powerful thing, I think, and it can, it can cause you to feel and believe things about yourself that are not true. And so for me, um, I didn't have any resources to combat the, the negative things that I felt about myself, about my life, about um, where things were going, and I felt like I had, um, I just had no options. Allie now shares her story with church groups and others as a way to remove any shame and stigma attached to suicide. It's a rare glimpse into the mind of someone who believed they were out of options and all alone. I was uh, 16 years old and somebody at my high school called in the office and they said, um, I think she's gonna kill herself. Somebody should do something about it. And so I got pulled into the school office and they, uh, they grabbed my arm and they pulled up my sleeve and there were cuts on my wrist and they, and they said, can you promise us that you won't do this? And I said, no. And so they um, called social services, called the police and it was a huge mess and they took me to and they took me to a hospital from school in front of everybody. And, uh, and so the whole small town was talking about what was going on. And I spent three days, um, three days in a hospital in a psychiatric unit. And I remember laying there thinking like, is this really the life that I was meant to live? Like, is this really it for me? Is this why I'm here? Ali Walleen had hit rock bottom those three days in April and the trip to the hospital. It was a really, really, really dark three days for me because I, um, you know, I was wrestling with this part of me that thought I was going to do something great and this part of me that believed I should just give up. But that alone wasn't enough to change her path of destruction. I left the hospital and things got more confusing, so I started uh, drinking and, and uh, getting high and spending time with boys I had no business spending time with and um, doing all of these things that were supposed to make me feel better. Her sadness went unchallenged, which in her mind made everything true. It wasn't a specific incident necessarily that led me to feel sad. It was moment after moment after moment that I chose not to fight how I felt. So what changed? The hour is upon us. Remember, Allie liked music and was drawn to the talents of another high school musician. She was walking in faith and I was not. <laughs> and I wanted to be friends with her, I was drawn to her. And I would invite her to drink, she'd invite me to church and I'd be like, we'd both tell each other no. So finally, a couple days before Christmas, she was like, I'll hang out with you if you come to church. I'd never been to church before. So I walked up to the door and as I'm walking up to the door, I was like, I was thinking, 
crap, what am I doing here? What am I doing? Like, I don't, I don't belong in a church. I'm a messed up kid. Like, I'm a mess. My whole town knows it. And my whole town watched me leave in a social service vehicle and get, like, get removed from school. I don't belong here. And we were late, so I walk in a little further, and the girl who invited me was singing, um, she was singing the words, this is the year that all of your tears will be dried. And I thought, whatever this is, th like this is what I was looking for. And that really was where everything changed for me. I think when somebody gets a little bit of hope that's real, then it, it changes everything. That day, I, I walked out of that church, I never cut again, I never drank again, never smoked again, because it was just like, this is, here's what I was looking for. This is the hope that I wanted.